What's up guys and welcome back to Microsoft Flight Simulator. Today we are in the cockpit of one of the most interesting aircraft I have ever seen. This is the Dornier Duex. I, it looks like Duex, but apparently online people call it the DOX or the DOX. Some people call it the Duex. I'm not sure what the right pronunciation is, but uh, this is just a fascinating aircraft vessel. So as you can see here, this is a giant German boat Lane, I, I guess is what you would call it. Let's go ahead and hop inside the cockpit here, dude. Look at this thing. <laughs> Obviously very, very old. I've got some, some stats and, and facts and things for you guys. We have actual s steering wheels. You can also pull them kind of like a, uh, a yoke, but that's, that's interesting there. Look at the gauges. Look at the seats, dude. Oh my goodness. This whole top area here is for the flight crew. So it looks like we've got an old map of the United States. Indexed air transportation lines. We've got old cartography tools, diaries, and old compass and things. If we head back here, this is going to be kind of like engine stuff. I don't know. We're, we're going to keep going. Back here, we've got our telecommunications. And then behind this door, again, some sort of a mechanical room. Back in the cockpit here. All right. We're going to go ahead and, and take off now. There is one issue. Like I said, this is a German boat plane. It's... It's not meant to be on asphalt. It's going to be fine. We're fine. It's it's all good. Not not a big deal at all. We we just need to slowly make our way to the water. To all the lovely folks on board, don't worry. I, I'm an expert. I've got this. And we're off. We've officially made it into the air here. In the... I, I don't know what to... I'm going to say DOX, but I think it might be wrong. A, a lot of people call it the DOX online because it stands for... Dornier something. I, I'm not sure. We're just going to call it the Duex. Let's get this thing down in the water. Sorry, folks. I had to do an emergency landing. I can't get over the inside of it. This looks like an actual ship. It looks like the, the pilot house of a, a ship. All right. Touchdown. There we go. This thing is so sick. I love it. By the way, we are in, uh, in Bora Bora again. There was a, a huge kind of like Pacific update a couple months ago. I've been meaning to go back here and uh, we finally made it. So let's go ahead and take off and let's talk about this thing. As you can see by the giant 1929s on the wings, that is when this thing first took its maiden voyage, July of 1929. Oh, this is a bit of a bumpy ride. Hang in there, folks. It was first conceived by Claudius Dornier in 1924. Then just five years later is when it first took flight. Three ended up being made over the course of the, the next three years. So three in total ever existed, built between 1929 and 1932. Now, the original point of this aircraft, believe it or not, was transatlantic flights. Can you imagine flying across the ocean in something this big and this slow? I, I, I can't even begin to conceive how that was possible. They even did flights between Europe and South America. Like we're not talking about short transatlantic flights. These were long haul transatlantic flights in this giant behemoth. Oh my goodness, Bora Bora looks so beautiful. Also notice the resorts. There's the Four Seasons. If you guys watch the vlogs, you know, we've been there. You've been there with us, but uh, they actually have like the overwater bungalows now. Before they were just kind of like flat spaces in, in the water, but now we actually have little little houses. I say we slow this thing down and we're, we're going to try to get down there. Dude, this thing is... <laughs> Just can't get, look at the little wind, the little wind thing. What reading is that giving us? Wind speed, airspeed, probably something like that. This is outrageous. So at the time of its inception, this was the largest aircraft in the world. No doubt about that. And uh, one of the most interesting things about it is it has 12 engines. You can see we have six, you know, kind of setups here, but they have two engines each. There's a pull and a push. And there's, there's, you know, separate motors. They were all V12s. They had about 610 horsepower each. And it had over 7,000 horsepower in total, which is absolutely ridiculous. And look at this. We made it. Pulling up to the Four Seasons Bora Bora. This is a lot different experience than Chelsea and I had. The fact that there is this much detail in this game is absolutely insane. Dude, these bungalows actually look like the Four Seasons bungalows. Like, they're... They're not defaults. These are actually the Four Seasons bungalows. And this 
is the one that Chelsea and I stayed in. I'm gonna have to pull a clip from the vlog. This is insane. I, I, this, this game is absolutely incredible. This was the front lobby. You arrived by boat. You can see here they have the boats. It's not the exact boat that they own, but still, they have boats here. The front lo oh, this is bringing back so many memories. I need to go back. This is my favorite place on earth by far. Here's the little lagoon that we paddle around with paddle boards and kayaks and stuff. Here was the main pool area, even has the circular pool. Dude, this is absolutely outrageous. I don't even know what to say. I can't believe the level of detail. They, they have absolutely been killing this game and I cannot wait for Flight Sim 2. Gonna see if we can take old girl back off again. A little bit nerd. Dude, it's so crazy that we have steering wheels here. That's amazing. So yeah, we're gonna turn all the way right and hopefully we're gonna be able to get up to speed. We got the St. Regis in front of us, so we're gonna be in trouble if we don't end up being able to take off. So yeah, when this thing first came out, largest aircraft of its time, I think it was the largest aircraft for like 20 years or something like that. It's still the aircraft with the most, oh boy, this is getting a little bit close. It's still the aircraft with the most piston engines ever created. Oh my goodness, dude. This is amazing. And there goes the St. Regis. Wow. I am absolutely blown away. Now, it's not rude to call this thing a boat because it quite literally is a boat, but it is so slow. The uh, cruising speed was about 110 miles per hour. The top speed was about 150. Now, I, I want to tie it back to, again, this thing mainly did transatlantic flights. In today's world, a flight from, from New York City to London is about seven hours on, on one of today's jets, which fly at about like 560, 575 miles an hour. Think about how long that would take in this thing flying at 110 miles an hour. And think about how today's jets can do that in one fuel up, whereas this thing would have to make multiple stops and, and continuously fuel up and it had tons of maintenance issues and things like that. Like, I think one of the maiden voyages ended up taking like three and a half or four days or something like that to go from Europe over to America. So I, it would not have been fun, but it was pretty luxurious. So this whole top area here that we walked through before, this is like the captain's area. This is, you know, where all the flight officers and all the maintenance and things happened. This bottom section down here was where they stored all their fuel. And then this center area was for the passengers. A little bit nervous about running into uh, Mount Otamanu here. Oh my gosh, dude. This looks so much better than when we first flew here. I don't want to get too close because we can't turn too quick. But yeah, this, this is pretty great. You can kind of see some of the, the people inside here. I don't think we're allowed to go in that. We can just see kind of like their, their outlines. But um, that middle area was super luxurious. Obviously, if you were flying in the 1920s and 30s, you had money. So it had seating for, uh, I think, around 100 passengers. It had lounges, bars, smoking areas. There was a library. Like, it, it was a very, very fancy experience. And it was something that most people in the world never got to see. I didn't even know this thing existed. But yeah, we have about 100 souls on board right now, plus around 14 or so crew. So the fact that we skidded this thing down an uh, asphalt runway was probably not the best idea. It actually held the world record for the most people on an aircraft ever at 169 on one of the flights. I don't know why they overloaded it like that, but that record stood for like 20 some years. This thing, it truly was like a, a marvel of the aviation industry. But unfortunately, it was also kind of a, a failure in some way. So like I said, they only made three of these from the years 1929 to 1932. And that was for a variety of reasons. As you would imagine, engine reliability was not great. It had a lot of stability issues. It had a ton of maintenance. It was really, really expensive to upkeep. It was expensive to fuel and, and operate. It didn't really run at that great of a profit. All of this was happening during the, the Great Depression. So like all of these factors led to this really not being a very good you know, production or commercial success. And it's sad because this thing had a lot of potential. You know, th this kind of showed what the future of aviation could look like. It just wasn't quite there yet. It needed a few tweaks. So while she specifically didn't necessarily succeed, it was still a, a clear, you know, step in the right direction for commercial aviation. This truly is a, a remarkable aircraft here. Just an absolute icon and, and kind of like a, um, I don't know, it, it represented the, the innovative spirit of the aviation industry and, and led to the planes that we have today, the land-based planes that fly a lot faster and are a lot more efficient. But dude, this thing, I, 
it's it's sick i really like it so there you guys have it we are gonna do one more takeoff here hopefully you enjoyed our flight here on the Dornier Du X. Hopefully all the landing and bumping and grinding and everything. Dude, the, the takeoffs, these would be rough. Getting something this big off the ground, this this would not be fun. That's for sure. But uh, thank you guys so much for watching. I'm going to see you guys in our next episode of Microsoft Flight Simulator. Let me know what we should fly next. This was a bit different than some of the jet fighters and stuff that we've been flying. So it felt good. I'll see you later.